I want you to look me in the eye right now and tell me that that wasn't fucking awesome. Guys, I am begging you to watch The Venture Brothers. You know I gotta do this Coke Zero crack. Ah, oh, yep, there we go. There's that nice crisp Coca-Cola voice. The Venture Brothers was an animated show that ran on the adult segment of Cartoon Network called Adult Swim from 2004 to 2018. The show was written and directed by its two creators, Doc Hammer and Jackson Public better known as Chris McCullough. The show ran for seven seasons and follows washed-up super scientist Dr. Thaddeus Rusty Venture, his teenage twin sons Hank and Dean Venture, and the family's bodyguard Brock Sampson, an agent of a secret organization called the Office of Secret Intelligence, or OSI. The OSI is a branch of the U.S. military that wages a secret war against the sinister Guild of Calamitous Intent. Although this war is really more akin to children playing pretend on the playground, and uh, that's kind of the charm of it. Rusty is the son of the deceased scientist and adventurer Jonas Venture Sr. And as a child, he was frequently dragged all over the world on adventures that left him with immense amounts of psychological damage, which he now projects onto his sons as well as anybody else around him. These exploits from Rusty's childhood were turned into the incredibly popular cartoon series The Rusty Venture Show. As an adult, Rusty skates by on both the popularity of his childhood image and the success of his father Jonas. And the show frequently deals with Rusty's struggle to maintain the legacy of both super science and adventure set forth by his father. The Venture family is constantly tormented by Rusty's arch nemesis, a butterfly-themed supervillain, supervillain being an actual legitimate career in this universe, named the Mighty Monarch, as well as his much more competent second-in-command, Dr. Girlfriend. Together, they also have a small army of henchmen who fly around in a giant cocoon. The Monarch is also essentially a main character of this show, and gets a lot of his own interesting storylines. The Monarch's primary conflicts in this show stem from from his flagrant disregard for regulations that have been put in place through treaties between the OSI and the Guild of Calamitous Intent. See, like I mentioned before, being a supervillain is a legitimate career in this universe, and as a result, there's a lot of people in this universe who sort of punch in and out of it, like it's a job. They maintain a work and life balance because they aren't their supervillains full-time. They're just people doing their jobs. But the Monarch isn't like this. The Monarch is a villain. His hatred is who he is, and his passion for his craft, as well as his passionate hatred for Rusty Venture, are the fiber of who he is, and he refuses to let anyone stand in his way. At its core, the show takes all kinds of things, from Saturday morning cartoons like Scooby-Doo, G.I. Joe, and Johnny Quest, science fiction pulp novels, comic books, and superheroes, and all other niche areas of pop culture, and satirizes them. But while this satirization is often self-aware, it's never done in a way that, I don't know, breaks the fourth wall or insults them for hoping that T's storylines will eventually become storylines. <laughs> yeah, I wonder what other show does that. The world of the Venture Brothers is also an eternal amalgamation of every subject that it parodies. It's like a constant crossover episode, but like if crossover episodes were good. And yes, I am including the Jimmy Timmy Power Hour. I will not elaborate. The best thing about this satirization is that it clearly comes from a place of love and adoration for the source material. For the nostalgia feeling of watching the good guys and the bad guys play their endless game of cat and mouse, for the insanity of the outlandish world of pulp fiction, for the conversations and arguments that you would have with your friends on who would win in a fight, Superman or Worldbreaker Hulk, or you know, what sort of biological organism the Smurfs are. Come on, they have one female servicing a large group of males. That implies a species that lays eggs. Oh my god, you're crazy. They are so obviously mammals. Please, she'd be an asterisk 24-7 if she didn't lay eggs. Smurfs don't lay eggs. I won't tell you this again. Papa Smurf has a f***ing beard. They're mammals. All of these things, along with the masterfully written themes of work-life balance, generational trauma, insecurity, failure, toxic masculinity, and familial legacy make this show truly special. Now, I know I'm being a little bit vague in my praise, but this isn't really a review. I'm not trying to get too into specific story elements because ultimately, I want this video to convince you to give it a chance. I could talk about this show forever, though. It's in my personal top five favorite shows of all time. Now, while this show has a lot of well-written themes and interesting motifs, none of them would matter without the conversation, which is the most important factor in making the show as amazing as it is. And what do I mean here when I say the conversation? Well, 
The show's two creators are also the main voice actors, so basically any time two characters are doing an extended dialogue bit on screen, it's the two creators just bouncing off of each other. We've done all we can, I'm sorry your placement isn't working out, but really it's not our problem. The Guild of Calamitous Intent is antagonist relations only. Well, who handles the good guys? Whoa, I think the less hurtful term is protagonist. If I were a woman, I'd marry you. And I'd jeopardize our friendship by nailing your hot wife. Why would you tell your mom I'm gay? I didn't tell her, I just didn't deny it. She sent us at China and the sideboard. Wait, you love that sideboard. So this is Peter. He's as handsome as you said he was, Billy. You said I was handsome? Pay the bill, I gotta use a can. Well, I'm not gonna sit here alone. I look like an idiot. Dude, you just ate dinner with a guy dressed exactly like you. Well, at least I look like a popular idiot. But that's not to say the rest of the voice cast is anything to sneeze at. You have James Urbaniak as Dr. Venture. Okay, I'm just turning 16 and having a birthday pool party. My father invites every girl he knows. And I'm not talking about girls my age. No, not Jonas. He invites playboy bunnies and models and I think actual whores, you know, real prostitutes. So there I am in my giant bathing suit with nervous puberty oozing out of my gigantic pores, just, just awful. So the band suddenly stops playing and I hear, and now the man of the hour, Rusty Venture. All eyes on me, right? Then suddenly, almost predictably, the action man shoots my groin with a shrink ray right as that f***ing jackass Colonel Gentleman pulls my shorts down. Well, it's like a nightmare. Oh, no, no. What I went through today was like a nightmare. What happened when I was 16? That is my life. You have Michael Sinterklaas as Dean Venture. <laughs> Hank. I always wished I had hair like yours. F*** you, Hank. <laughs> you know how they say that we come into this world alone and we leave it alone? Well, we came into it together. So come back to me. Patrick Warburton as Brock Sampson. Guild works clean, professional. It's surgical with them. In a way, they're the only organization I still respect. And they kill clean. Don't let Deems get in the way. Honestly, Hank, where do you pick that stuff up? I never see you read. It's weird, right? It's like he channels dead crazy people. You think it's a cry for help? Steven Rattazzi as Dr. Orpheus. Hey! You dick! Dr. Orpheus did this! To exact proper retribution, you can find me at this address. Nights only. Dana Snyder as the alchemist. He snapped lost touch with this world and created another. We must spirit him to safety. He's creepy. I am so not going to touch him. And Charles Parnell as Jefferson Twilight. Yes, I only hunt Blackulas. Oh, so you only hunt African-American vampires. No, sometimes I hunt British vampires. They don't have African-Americans in England. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, good point. So I hunt Blackulas. Well, I was just trying to be... Man, I specialize in hunting black vampires. I don't know what the PC name for that is. The entire order of the triad is great. I mean, I love all three of these guys. And so many more characters and voice actors all carry the show equally. Every conversation feels real. And despite the fact that a large portion of the characters are voiced by the two creators, every character is incredibly complex and unique. But that's not just because of their voices, either. The artistic team on this show deserves an immense amount of praise for creating designs that so flawlessly represent the spirit of their characters. I mean, just look at Hank and Dean Venture, the titular Venture Brothers, as an example. Hank's outfit is, of course, an homage to Fred from Scooby-Doo. Well, I mean, is it an homage if it's a direct copy? I don't know. I'm a moron. It's Fred's outfit from Scooby-Doo. That, that's, that's what it is. And Dean's outfit is modeled after Encyclopedia Brown. But what do these designs represent? Well, Hank is impulsive. He's an actionary character. He has that white boy confidence that comes from being raised by a billionaire super scientist. And he embraces every aspect of the crazy world that he constantly finds himself surrounded by. Hank isn't extraordinarily intelligent, but he has a natural charisma that allows others to forgive his social transgressions. And and while he isn't necessarily a leader, he's often the one who's goading his more timid brother Dean into action. Dean, like I just said, 
is more timid and shy than Hank, but he's also substantially more intelligent and inquisitive. Unlike Hank, he more often resists the world that he was born into, and despite pressure from his father to pursue super science like himself and his father before him, he frequently searches for escapes from his daily life, like reading mystery novels or carefully writing and curating articles for his house's newspaper. Yes, Dean Venture writes a newspaper every week for his house, and amazingly, the subscribers for this are great than zero. My subscribers number well into the teens. Dean usually only acts in response to things as they happen to him. His actions are rarely those that cause other events to happen. There are exceptions to this, but Dean is just more passive and reactionary by nature as opposed to Hank's actionary nature. And the brilliance of this is that Fred from Scooby-Doo is also confident, charismatic, and actionary. And Encyclopedia Brown is intelligent, inquisitive, and a massive fucking nerd. So so by designing these characters like these characters, you can already make the basic assumptions about their personalities just from the pre-established notions you have as something as simple as their clothing. Nobody is ever put into this story as fodder, or rather if they are, it's fairly obvious from the get-go. Everybody has their place in the story, even if it's just for a little while. Now, yes, since the show premiered in 2004, it does have a little bit of that early 2000s style humor. The first few seasons in particular haven't aged amazingly in some cases, and I don't think it's particularly difficult to look past that and to recognize the achievement of everything else that this show accomplishes. I will also admit that the first half of the first season is a tiny bit shaky, but it establishes characters and ideas that become important later. And that isn't to say that the first half of the first season is bad, it's just not as strong as the rest of the show. Now, remember earlier when I mentioned that the show had ran for 14 years, but somehow only had seven seasons? Well, it's because at the time, Adult Swim was notoriously slow when it came to greenlighting new seasons of their programming, which of course causes the rest of production to be delayed even further. The network definitely still has this issue, but it seems to have been curbed a little bit in the last several years. The show had an average gap of two years between seasons, and because of the inconsistent production schedule, ratings were also a bit sporadic at best and disappointing at worst. And then, unfortunately, in September of 2020, as the show was beginning production on its eighth season, one of the illustrators broke the news of the show's cancellation on Twitter. This was a result of internal restructuring within the company. Fans were of course devastated. This meant that the series would now be ending with so, so many questions that would forever be unanswered. We officially entered the all is lost moment. But then, nearly a year after the show's cancellation, an announcement was made in May of 2021. A direct-to-DVD movie was to be produced and serve as the end to the series, and would eventually also be available on HBO Max. Shit, I'm so stupid, it's Max now. Fuck. Ah, oh, I'm so- <sighs> I'm real sorry guys, I mean to mess that up so bad. The Venture Brothers movie, Radiant is the Blood of the Baboon Heart, will be released on July 21st, 2023, and is expected to be released on Max later this fall. The entire series up to this point is available on both Hulu and Max, and with each season ranging from about 10 to 16 episodes, there's plenty of time to get caught up before the movie comes out. I really think that the inconsistent production of this show, as well as its frequently changing time slot, that was already late in the night on Sunday of all days, kept it from getting both the audience that it needed and deserved on Adult Swim. However, this show is an absolute gift. It's beautiful, it's ridiculous, heartfelt, and absolutely insane. With a sprawling and carefully crafted world and narrative that gets richer and deeper with every episode and every character. And even if it's not your cup of tea, which is totally okay, the best that I can hope for is that this video convinced you to give it a chance. And even if this show gets just one new fan from this video, it will have been worth it. If you like this video, please consider subscribing. My name is Isaiah, and thank you for watching my video. Monarchs residence! Hello? To whom am I speaking? Who's this? I asked you first. Hey, you called me, pal. Who is it? You won't say. I think it's a telemarketer. Hang up. Don't hang up! This is your leader speaking. I have a series of commands. Who? Your leader. It's me, the Monarch! Who is it? He says he's the Monarch. The possible Monarch's in jail. 24. Tell him to shut up. He says shut up! The guy! Right, the monarch would never say that! Yes, I would! Guess what? That was me saying that! Saying exactly that, right now! Ah! 
Put 24 on. Here, he wants to talk to you. Told you to hang up. Unbelievable. Hello? 24? This is the monarch speaking. Ask him something only the monarch would know. Okay, good one. Okay, um... Uh... Listen to me, 24. Listen to me very carefully, because I am no longer speaking to you. I am speaking to a dead man. 